You'll mind that. Welcome, everybody, and welcome to the fifth in this series um, of Talks on Towns, hence Talking Town. Sorry, I've un unmuted myself there. Um, I'm Miriam Fitzpatrick, and I'm on the working group of the UCD Centre for Irish Towns. Um, I'm an assistant professor at the School of Architecture, Planning and Environmental Policy. And today um, is a fifth in our series, and it's on at the subject of the life of towns through the lens of public space. Thank you uh, for joining us and um, our two speakers and myself and Katrina have all made different ventures from small towns in Ireland to UCD. Um, our first guest is Eleanor Bascalorgi and she's just finishing her final Masters in Architecture in the next month. Um, and our second guest is architect and urbanist Valerie Mulvan. Um, we are seeing are you seeing strange things there? Sorry. No, I don't. I just I see okay. somebody else projecting. It's not weird. Okay. Um, apologies okay. for that. <laughs> I think as people enter, I see maybe their um, avatar. So um, Eleanor is going to begin and Valerie will follow. And each talk will be something in the order of 10 to 20 minutes. And that allows us then for about 20 minutes of questions afterwards. So I'll introduce each uh, just before they speak. Um, Eleonora has developed her research and her design thesis on the subject of Irish towns and with an interest in photography which was inspired by a module she did with Professor Hugh Campbell last year. She became interested in combining Irish towns and photography for her major research essay in the first trimester last year. And Orla Murphy and Philip Crow, who's here, and myself brought these uh, a group, subgroup together under an umbrella of CFIT for that research dissertation. And that's what Eleanor is going to address today. Her essay developed um, the untapped and really underdeveloped potential of photographs and how they can contribute to our understanding of streetscapes. And by exploring the process of image maker how photographers of towns in particular and Irish towns um, can offer new insights into the relationship between people and the built environment. Our second guest, urbanist and architect Valerie Mulvan, is also a graduate of UCD and um, studied in the city just before UCD moved the School of Architecture to Richview, so she was based in Earlsford Terrace. And she's a founder of the practice McCullough Mulvan a member of East Donna and an enthusiastic and informed advocate for Irish towns. So I will introduce Valerie in more detail before her talk, but first we're going to hear from Eleanor, who's going to present her lovely and original work on photography of Irish towns. So Eleanor, if you're able to share your screen. Yeah, I could do that now. So um, welcome. Thank you, thanks very much for that introduction. Um, so, is that coming up okay? Can you see that? Yeah. Okay, so the title of my essay was An Investigation into the Making of Photographs, Looking at Streetscapes in Irish Town from 1880 to 2014. And like Miriam said, um, my interest arose during my undergraduate degree when we had a lecture from Hugh Campbell where he spoke about architecture and photography and the overlap between the two. And we looked at um, Lots of famous photographers like Helen Levitt, um, Robert Frank, Henry Cartier-Bresson, just to name a few. Um, so that was something that I, a topic that I was really interested in. And then at the beginning of the dissertation, um, I was a group of one of five students under the guidance of the Centre for Irish Towns. Um, and we were looking at possible avenues to explore Irish towns. So, I identified this gap where the current literature used photography and photographs, so the current literature in Irish towns to reinforce their points, um, so as visual aids. But I'm inspired from my lecture with you, I believe that there was potential um, to take photographs as a central focus and that they had potential to contribute to the understanding of Irish towns. 
So then as I went about my research, um, I came across a quote by Ansel Adams, and it said that you don't take a photograph, but you make it. So then my essay became about unpicking this quote and exploring the processes of image making by the photographer, and then how these resulting images can offer insights into the relationship between people and their built environment. So there's that quote just by Ansel Adams. And then I took six different photographs of six different towns by six different photographers all along the west coast of Ireland. And the time period was from 1880 to 2014. And while the time period was of lesser significance, it did kind of encapsulate the evolution of the camera, which I lightly touched on in my essay. So then with each photograph, in order to unpick the negotiating of the image making, I looked at the equipment and the technologies used. I looked at the photographer's agenda and also their encounter with the time. And then at the same time, I was also looking at how the influence of architecture on the inhabitants of the time is depicted through these images and how the architecture shapes this inhabitation. And what I kind of came to realize, which was really interesting, was just that it's these varied punctuations of social inhabitation within the time that the photographer is drawn towards, um, and that's what they capture. So my first case study was taken by Robert French, and it's of O'Connell Street in County Sligo in 1865. And Robert French was commissioned by William Lawrence to capture photographs of Ireland for commercial purposes, which were highly sought after at the time. Um, and French had developed this unique style of photographing. So he had this elevated vantage point where he looked out onto the street life um, and so his encounter, or sorry, his agenda was that it was for commercial reasons. He was commissioned by William Lawrence. And then the equipment that he used, he used a large format camera, um, which was bulky and cumbersome, and it would have required to have been set up. Um, and then to, to achieve that vantage point, he would have needed some type of platform or a kind of scaffolding. Um, and he had a very overt presence too, so the spectacle of image making at the time would have drawn or gained some attraction. So even from this image here, you can see the little boy in the centre who's looking at the camera. Um, and he also, so his counter, encounter with the time, he was given time to study and get familiar with the space and he would have known when was like the peak time to capture his image when the lighting was right so all these um, negotiating elements influence the outcome of the photo but then if we look at the architecture from that vantage point i think the architecture looks more dominant um, in the image and you can see the undulating awnings as reflected in the ebb and flow of the people on the street and then also there's lots of little moments of social interaction so on the curb of the cornerstone you can see two people are talking to one another or at the base of the light there's the children sitting um, and this shows how the architecture supports and facilitates um, the social life of the street so because i don't live too far away from sligo i try to recreate the photos that he had made and i think what's really apparent is the difference in the negotiating of the image making so um, mine was just a quick snapshot. I didn't spend too much time in the time. There was limitations to my study in that I couldn't recreate the same image with the same equipment. So I used a different camera um, and the architecture continues. It remains the same, but you can still see there's little signs of how it's continuing to facilitate the inhabitants. So there's a man busking there underneath um, just at the door frame. And there's a figure here where the lady was standing in the previous image. So that was an interesting um, comparative study to do. So another um, photograph, this is Alexander Campbell Morgan's image of Boyle in County Roscommon. And Alexander Campbell Morgan was a wartime pilot, but during peace times, he traded in aerial photography. So his agenda was he was creating this unique view of Ireland from the sky. Um, and his encounter with the time was brief and it was fleeting because he was in an airplane, but also he used a medium large format camera, which would have still required some um, maintenance or some careful, careful work with it, despite being up in the sky. And when we look at the architecture here, you can see how the urban contrasts with the rural and that juxtaposition of um, the hinterlands with the center of the town uh, is really important or integral to our reading of 
the town and it really showcases the small scale of Boyle. So then I'll move on to Harry Callahan took this photo of um, Kilkey in County Clare. And besides the lone figure in the background and the unseen presence of Harry Callahan himself, the town is devoid of people. But you can see the scripts on the pavement or the tire marks on the road. And you can also see the colorful facades, which is quite quintessential of Irish towns. And it's these little aspects of um, like personality or care from the inhabitants, which is kind of reinforced by their presence not being there that really reinforces how the built fabric um, facilitates everyday ebb and flow and hustle and bustle. Um, so Harry also used a small format camera which kind of reduced the process of image making purely just to the act of seeing so he could, cap could focus on just capturing what he desired. Um, and yes, so here is Martin Parr's image of Belle Mullet, um, and it's quite an interesting photograph. So I was talking to, in my research, I was communicating with Martin Parr, and he told me that he lived in the northwest of Ireland at the time of this, uh, when this photo was taken, and that he just leisurely went out to take photographs on his own will, um, and he had a small format camera. So this is reflected in the image that you have this fleeting moment where the composition of the figures on the pavement and you've got the really interesting quality of light coming in so he would have had a short time frame to capture that image um, and you can still see how it's quite informal you've got the boot of the high ace fan and then there's a shadow creeping in on the other side so all of that you can see how everything is interrelated with the um, the encounter the equipment and the agenda and then the architecture facilitates this scene so that the two figures fit um, onto the pavement. You can see the decorative framing of the window and you've got the threshold of the doorway, which is recessed slightly. And it's all these little moments or these little features of architecture that facilitates the, the interaction with the space. Um, and then similarly, here is Harry Gruyart also was capturing, um, so he had no agenda, he was just going out to take photos for himself. Um, and this is quite a common scene, I guess, in Irish towns. So it's this little threshold space. So the door, the open doorway um, divides the public space from the private. Um, and you've got the women in this threshold and it acts as an anchor point where they're communicating with one another sort of from the safety of their interior world and um, looking out onto the streetscape and while the lady walking by there's no um, interaction with them so you can sense that the two at the door feel comfort and comfortable and safe whereas the woman perhaps is slightly intimidated or she's trying to walk by quite quickly um, and also the same as the previous image where the small format camera lent itself to this fleeting quick moment. Um, yes, so, and then lastly, I looked at Doug Du Bois. So he's an American photographer who spent six or five years in Ireland during the summer, getting very familiar with the town of Cove. And his photography is really interesting because it's all staged. Um, and he used a large format camera, so he set everything up, he knew what he wanted to capture, and he said that he had a digital camera where he would test lighting or test different compositions. But you can see here how the architecture um, kind of stages the scene. The children are using every possible surface area that they can, and you can see how um, it how the architecture accommodates the play of the children um, and how Dubois or Dubois way of capturing the scene, his encounter with the time, equipment that he used and his agenda is reflected in the final image. Um, so those were the six photographs that I looked at and just there were so many other possible avenues for research afterwards. So the six photographs that I looked at were um, by six male photographers. So it's through a masculine lens, but what would be really interesting, I think would be to track the same tra trajectory, but through a female lens. So from female photographers um, and then compare the two. Or also what was really interesting is that the, the photographer's present is so essential in the outcome of the photograph and maybe to compare modern day technologies with like drone photography where the photographer is absent in that process and perhaps comparing those aerial images um, by 
Morgan with drone photography could be interesting. And there were so many other um, areas. So maybe the internal uh, scene of Irish towns, interior world compared to exterior worlds. But yes, it was a very interesting topic and maybe something that I would like to pursue in the future. But that is all for now. So thank you very much for listening. Thanks so much, Eleanor. Um, one thing I hadn't reckoned on over our lunch break is just time to pause and to look closely and to hear you narrate the details of these images. So really, thank you so much for that. Um, and we might also both um, agree that we were indebted to Valerie's recent book to prompt us to even find um, Morgan. So thank you. Um, so I'll introduce Valerie next and then she will present. Um, even though Valerie probably to all of us townies here probably needs little introduction, but it's worth saying she was born in Bray and graduated at UCD. She won a postgraduate scholarship to go to Rome, where she studied and analysed layers of history based on serial study of the amazing Nolly maps. These remarkable figure ground maps demanded a patience and enthusiasm for carved out or contained public space that permeates, I'm going to say, um, much of the spatial complexity of the work that she has done. And also, I'm imagining, got you through the painstaking analysis needed for your latest publication on towns last year, which was approximate formality, the morphology of Irish towns. I got the pleasure of reading every word of it last year. It's a real labor of love. So it's great that you're here. Uh, for us, but I might as well also add Valerie um, collaborated with Neil McCullough on a rare gem that I own and I know it's uh, out of print, but an anthology of Irish building types known as a lost tradition um, by Gandon Editions in 1987. And from 1986, together with Neil, she founded McCullough Mulvan Architects, a practice that really has gone on to do amazing, wonderful work and was essential to the finding of Group 91 very inspirational in all of our lives and in the architecture of Dublin and went on to design many award win winning buildings. Um, you mentioned a fair bit is what you said of work at Trinity uh, that includes the Usher Library and the amazing Long Room at uh, two lovely libraries that I know Waterford and Rush um, and an incredible I think million square feet of a campus um, designed for they par in finished in 2019. Um, but also one of my favorite towns and two great contributions um, that have added to kind of like a dumbbell in the town, St. Mary's Church and the New Butler's Gallery in the heart of Kilkenny. So that's just some of the work that I know that you have worked, but between all of this, I don't know how you do it, but managing a practice, doing this work. She completed a master's in urban studies at Trinity in 1991, um, presented across the globe is a teacher, um, regular commentator, and an external examiner at Edinburgh. And I believe already working on your next book. But today, I think you're going to concentrate on your thoughts on town. So welcome, Valerie. Thanks for being here. Thank you here. very much. Thank you very much, Miriam. That's a very kind introduction. And thank you for inviting me to be part of Talking Towns and to maybe just discuss ideas a bit more to, to help you know, our, the appreciation of our amazing but generally unappreciated towns. Um, to set, the, I'm just going to try and share the screen now and uh, just it'll be, uh, see if I can do this again. Um, can you all see that? Perfect, yeah. Yeah, good. Okay. Um, well, now let me just um, go to there. Now, do I? Perfect. So um, I, I just want to set the scene and some people who, who are um, on, on this call, I'm sure will have seen here, heard and seen some of these images before, but um, just to kind of set the scene about, you know, what what kind of got me into the idea of looking at towns. Um, a few sentences from one of our great present day writers, Kevin Barry, um, from his incredibly um, bleak and black and funny uh, short story, Ideal Homes. And he says, the village was an unimpressive tangle of a dozen streets. There was a main street and a square, one as drab as the other, and a woeful few streets subsidiary to these. There was an insignificant river, brown and slow, and granite hills beyond. These, it was said, gave the place a scenic charm. 
but in truth it was forlorn. The people were terraced in neat rows and roofed in with grey slates and were themselves forlorn, but they wouldn't easily have said why. So to me, that kind of described uh, when I was a teenager, the world I grew up in where Irish town seemed hopelessly dull and all excitement was elsewhere. So what has changed? And I think some of it is to do with the phenomenon that the pandem pandemic enabled. In other words, that we all realized we could work remotely. It was a kind of a plague year feeling that cities should be abandoned because they were unsafe. And huge numbers of people simply went home. And suddenly in a kind of unique moment, they could see that these towns gave all the intimacy and potential of a neighborhood where you could live a rich and gentle life. And people also saw towns offering less expensive property, no commuting, and best of all, the sense of arriving into an instant environment and finding there all the elements you need. I think there's a huge interest now in architecture everywhere in the population, but it does tend to focus more on the individual rather than the communal. So TV dramas about ideal homes rather than programs about what we could do together, about the underused centres of our traffic filled towns. So I have about 20 slides now and I'm just going to go through them quite quickly to talk about Irish towns from the point of view of their remarkable public spaces, these really simple geometric forms that make up their centres. And to start with, if you look at this slide of Temple Moor, I mean, it is a really extraordinary image. And yet when this image, and this is a Morgan, uh, an Alexander uh, Campbell Morgan image, uh, just like the one that uh, Eleanor had, um, when pictures like this were first published by The Independent in its weekly series from the 1950s, it was probably the first time anyone had seen their towns from the air. And yet even now we take spaces like this totally for granted. And we haven't at all negotiated a language to celebrate their formality. If this was in Italy, for example, the square would be paved from side to side, there'd be a couple of cafes, there'd be tables out in the square, people would use it and not cars. And um, that's not even to say cars should be banished, but they shouldn't be uh, in, our, in our main outdoor rooms. We've tended to make our squares and streets into car parks. So I think our conversation today has also to involve a shift from global to local and current happenings to our east ask questions about how we live and the new necessity, for example, of securing our fuel and food supplies and the urgency of climate change have given that whole debate a really pressing immediacy. And the pandemic has also made us question the old model of continuous globalization, continuous expansion. New, town, new plans for our towns, in my opinion, need to be about small scale brilliant ideas in all kinds of places. So I don't think there's a magic bullet. There's no big gesture. There's just imagination. So using what's there, being ingenious with it, working with it or against it, but understanding it and imagining it into something fresh for now and making it really great. So every bit of it, both the anonymous bits and the signature bits. And I think the most important thing we can do is to understand we're inheriting a unique cultural landscape into which we should intervene with great care. So. Last year, as, as uh, Miriam said, my pandemic project was to finish a book, Approximate Formality, and what I became obsessed with was the extraordinary planimetric clarity of these towns and the politics and history that resulted in many of them being laid out at once to a predefined plan. And so uncovering their stories and sometimes from pretty inauspicious material on the ground, um, you know, they're made in colonial situations, the strange apartheid that perpetuates undermined their extraordinary achievement from a cultural and architectural point of view for a long time. So I've been exploring their originality and I think they really need to be understood not just as local culture, but really part of world culture. And this research tries to connect everything together. It says there's a tradition of building towns in this country, whether we like it or not. It's important in the canon of art and architecture. It has a really particular spare character that's uh, totally unique in its level of formality and that that is derived from its geography and its history. And it's really important, I think, for us to use those public spaces at their center and take them with us into the future. But to do that, of course, we have to understand their essence. So when I first began this research, I was struck by the astonishing uniformity of character of so many towns in Ireland. Um, and the Lawrence collection of photographs, in my view, captures them at their best between about 1870 and 1910. And then the Morgan collection of aerial photographs from the 50s just kind of freezes them as complete geometric entities. Um, and so I think when you when you start to look at those photographs and they're full of, you know, summer trees and little spatial containers, market carts, fair days, that was a starting point for trying to understand the formality that these places have. So you could protect them as uh, as, as things in themselves while setting the scene for a new generation of people to inhabit them in new ways. But if you're talking about public spaces, I don't think we can talk about how to make towns talk without understanding why a place is the way it is. Placemaking 
is a concept much talked about these days. And in my opinion, it's often just a, re a recycling of unoriginal everywhere gestures. There's little appreciation of what's actually there on the ground. So we need to be open-eyed to have deeply observed, to have listened to the forms and spaces and to have soaked up why a town th is the way it is. So what made those strange corners? What made the building line move from one position to another? What's, how is that delicate tissue of materiality uh, made up and why has it developed this way? And that's, I think, amplified by, by maps and archival sources. That's where our public space comes from. It's charged with history, marked by time. And incidentally, it has no legislative protection at all. So we have to take that on in rethinking these, uh, these, these brilliant spaces uh, so we can protect them for future generations. So many towns at the moment are aiming with the best intentions to improve, but they're reaching for the catalogue of traffic bollards, lampposts, cobble ox seats, hanging baskets and parking bays. And the latest um, lovely addition is plastic sticks for cycle lanes. In other words, they're leaving the status quo as it is and tinkering at the edges. Instead, I think we have to ask what's original and interesting about each of these spaces and what makes its character? What's its genius loci? And then to move on from there. So I've tried to chart this tradition of making collective spaces for living and trading in, starting with early towns around the monasteries and finishing just into the 20th century when J.M. Singh and Jack Yates were asked by the Manchester Guardian to travel through the congested districts of the Western Seaboard in 1904 and record their impressions. And Singh writes about Bell Mullet um, with a St. John's Eve bonfire in the main square. He says the streets are noisy and squalid, lonely and crowded at the same time. A gramophone in one house, a fiddle in the next, then an accordion and a fragment of a lullaby. Many crying babies, pigs and donkeys. The effect is not indistinct. And that's a very stark contrast to today. We've gone from congested districts to empty, unused towns. But to go back a little, I'd like to talk about what are the qualities of small town life in Ireland during different periods and how they're supported by the built fabric we've inherited. And I'm really focused on the idea that if we could re-inhabit these towns properly, not only could thousands of people be housed, but they would create the best possible public spaces uh, because those spaces would be inhabited by people. Um, and it's like the wall of faces in a theatre. So towns are really our theatre of the everyday. So taking this photograph of Clonmel from the 1890s, you could imagine living there today. And in fact, I think I did, as Miriam said, I caught the edge of that kind of small town living as a child growing up in Bray in the 1960s. So the town feels like a complete space. It's a wall of buildings inhabited by people and shops. It's full of activity. And we need to know what generated all of those uh, elements that brought the town to its conclusion. And here you see Clonmel again in an aerial shot. Um, the feudal system in Ireland, which has its own particular architecture uh, for medieval towns, it's a kind of mathematics crossed with a family tree. The medieval town plan is generally set out all at once. It's the simplest way to divide a plot of land economically with a street or a grid laid out with tiny frontage to the marketplace and a church in a space by itself. And there are loads of variations of these. You'll see here like Kilmallock, um, which, is, which is very informal, although it's kind of a wandering line, or Butterbent, which is incredibly uh, strong and, and simple. They're really a very pragmatic organization, which gives the maximum number of people access to a marketplace. And the remarkable thing when you, when you go into the uh, study of these is that the persistence of property boundaries set out in the 13th century are still there to the present day. And you see all these wonderful organizations and inventive shapes that were made for marketplaces, trumpet shaped here like Thurless and Feathered, and um, just how, they, how they've been, how they've developed. This slide of Galway, for instance, um, really describes how medieval towns have come through our complex history, maybe the best. Um, they're the kind of the, the layering of the, of the first on the ground. They're most obviously within that European canon of urbanism. We've, we've forgotten about the Normans and how they excluded the Irish. This is a uh, 1583 map which describes the really beautiful formal qualities of the town, walled, gated, grid of streets dividing to go to the port beside St. Nicholas's Church. Outside the walls, right and left, you've got the two abbeys. And at that point um, before the Reformation, linking natives and invaders under one god, but still made in a contested territory, so it needed a wall, just like the rest of Europe. 
And like the rest of those comfortable medieval towns everywhere else in Europe, in Ireland, those towns were excluding those who had been before, and at best agreeing to a market space or a fair green or an Irish town at the gates. This is the Faith in Wexford, amazing uh, place, which was exactly that, a, a kind of a symbol of the apartheid that continued that duality of conversation about towns in Ireland, begun maybe by the Vikings when they set up beside the monastic towns. So our complex history, particularly during the plantations, makes us a little bit ambivalent to towns and what they represent. So this slide of Fort Protector, which is the town of Maryborough or Port Leash now from the 1560s, and it really shows the mark of colonization like a branding on the landscape. And its inevitable consequence, of course, is the displacement of people. So the plain fact was that towns were used first to hold territory and then to turn a profit. And you can see here this very, very set out grid of, 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 of buildings on all and building line, around the fort and this one in particular had a, a, a moat around it to, uh, to make a, a sort of a protected area. And British colonial policy has always been very good at justifying wholesale land transfer by their stated ambition to colonize the wild Irish and their moral imperative to improve uh, the land. And that really concealed a, a very big profit motive, which was exporting uh, all the profits across the water. So Irish towns, Irish clans rather, were drummed out of their ancestral towns and monasteries. Um, and it just gives us to understand how there are always two very, very sharp and distinct points of view in Ireland. But plantation is difficult and expensive. And under James I, globalization began to fund his political ambition. Much of the Ulster plantations were funded by the London companies. And these were guilds of merchants like Skinners and Salters and Vintners, who used their wealth and expertise to found towns becoming development agents in the north of Ireland, much as the Virginia Stock Company and the East India Company worked in America and in India. And they did very well out of the bargain and they set up some of the more successful towns of the plantation period, like early 17th century Coleraine here in this slide, which is a trial piece for Derry with its grid of streets, its marketplace and the port on the river. And everybody is familiar with the savagery of the plantations and that cruel translation of populations. The whole country really was a laboratory for English experimentation on their Irish subjects at the time. But while plantation towns are really hammered out military statements on the ground, we do have to recognize that these towns were also very ambitious and they were grounded in Renaissance thinking about urban space, which was common across Europe and the new world. So you can see axial relationships, centralized grid plans, closed corners of squares like this one and triangular spaces or diamonds. Towns are really very political statements like this famous image of Derry as a walled grid plan with the cannons in the main square uh, excluding and defending. But the fact was there were never enough transplanted people to totally, totally reimagine the country either. So Irish tenants farmed the land, paid the rent, and sometimes even occupied the town streets in their own cabins, maintaining that apartheid that I've talked about already. Um, so you see this continuing post the 1641 rebellions. These essentially Renaissance squares with their closed corners. This is uh, the plan of Port Arlington from a map of about 1685. So it's based on, on a town like Charleville in, from, in France. And here in Port Arlington, right uh, at that time in 1685, they were, they were building those curved bastions, which you can see uh, protecting at the edge of the town. You've got this very, very strong sense of a square with its cross streets, which join in the middle, the marketplace in the center. So it's incredibly formally set up in order to just give that sense of, of um, a very beautiful organization. Um, that whole layout survived substantially until about 10 years ago. Um, this is Port Arlington as it was in the 1950s when Morgan took uh, another photograph of it. Um, and about 10 years ago, they really uh, ruined this whole corner here by building a new relief road, um, completely ignoring the sense of what that particular fine square was. So you can see it here as a complete geometric organization. And then as the warlike 17th century was recast into a more enlightened 18th century, it's worth remembering that in just the same way as planters were never sufficient to completely flood the country, the next generation of towns were built by ordinary Irish people in a sort of grudging symbiotic contract of sorts with their landlords. So that's a story that's rarely celebrated. They built all the shops and sheds, all the walls that make the spatial containers we now recognize as towns in Ireland. 
And those more peaceable times allowed landlords to make their biggest investments, which was also not really their houses, but pretty often their towns. Sometimes really interesting experiments about agriculture, prom promoting industries like linen, and of course, rental income from their tenants. This is a map from the first Ordnance Survey, and the Ordnance Survey engineers mapped Stratford-on-Slaney here in the Wicklow Hills as two very formal spaces, an oval here at this side and a circus here, and then a cross axis between a church and, uh, and a meeting house. And that's all above the manufactory, which was funding the whole thing down by the river. So while that remarkable plan certainly was the formal plaything, if you like, of a privileged class. It did have geometric and spatial expression absolutely full of ambitious um, architecture. And that's very innovative in European urban design terms. And even though it's hardly a village now, you could imagine that if people were to fill those amazing spaces and build back the intended outline, what an extraordinary place it would be. Not all promoters of new towns were landlords either. This is Port Law in County Waterford. And this was an enterprise built by the Quaker Malcolmson family to um, house all of their mill workers. And the gates of the mill are down here. All life radiates out in streets from the factory gates. And there are huge numbers of towns which are simply themselves. Linear towns are a neat array of buildings around a square. And this is Rathdowney at the top and Moy uh, in the north down the bottom. These are great uh, examples of empty and full spaces, which is the kind of market condition. It explains bits of iron railing on the window sills, which um, in Eleanor's uh, picture of the cow just passing in front of the window, uh, those railings had been removed. And I'd say that woman was really just hoping the cow wasn't going to end up in her front room. These are the equivalent of the Italian, French and Spanish squares that we all enjoy on holidays, but they're really just not recognized. They're just as good. They just need to be treated properly like total outdoor rooms. And the next slide, which is of Westport, which is kind of shocking to see that paucity of materials, how everything is so broken down in character. And it kind of just reminds you how tenuous the whole enterprise was. And in fact, how much of a risk those landlords were taking. So the Earl of Alt Altamont down there on his column in the midst of all those broken structures, it's an absolute miracle that that was retained and managed to become the foremost 18th, 18th century town in Ireland. So in a quick summary, as an architect, I'd say the first and most significant quality of Irish towns is their form. So that's the space defined by the wall of buildings. And that form, as I said before, is also the least protected in our planning legislation as an entity in itself. So in France, Spain, Italy, Portugal, there's an understanding of public space, of street and wall surfaces being continuous, design isn't showy, it's deeply embedded in the place and there's a seamless understanding of materials. And architects are trained in these, in these matters to get it right. In Ireland, we've really lost a sense of our town's value as bright, brilliant public spaces, and we didn't believe in them at the time to the extent of paving them properly or designing them as simple, beautiful spaces and getting the cars out of the centre. So we've huge unused buildings, huge numbers of them in, in our towns, some say up to 80% vacancy, which needs to find uses. Most appropriate use, of course, is often housing, and we need to balance conservation with sustainable and social values. So I think we need a project of recovery to find ways of bringing life back into these towns, building by building, street by street, and that has to take on that idea of place. So um, in a way you could post pandemic with remote working and a cosmopolitan population who've traveled the world that could allow us to view the town, these towns in a, in a much more hopeful way. But it does need a bit of a change of, of mindset from a lot of official Ireland. So for example, if you look at this building of La Hinch, it's in La Hinch, it's a hotel, a bakery, a bar and a house. There's a yard behind for animals, all under the one roof in the one plot. So it's completely multivalent and it's that kind of complexity we need to get back into our towns. We need to occupy the shops as houses at ground and upper floors. We need to take on old factories as houses and workplace. And we need to develop new paradigms like loft style living or dividing up different floors across different plots. Government has endless policies and papers to support everything that I'm saying today and everything the town centres uh, would be saying. So why do we have so many small towns with their centres underused and rotting? And I think the answer to that is that not enough work is going on to clear the log jams created by the same government's regulations. So, for example, fire officers who run their own fiefdoms and impose beyond regulatory standards, planning officers who should be targeting things to make the local area plans work, conservation officers who should support radical approaches which respect materiality and form. Insurance companies who won't insure anything but the most standard situation, banks, of course, who won't lend, 
to more flexible ways of occupying building and models of ownership. But people do this all over Europe. And I think local authorities could kind of help to fast track all of this process by doing a series of pilot projects in towns, publishing them well and giving them some grant aid. There's loads of architects, young and old, who would love to be involved in that kind of project. So I'm kind of just hinting at a context for these great instant urban environments to support their sustainable use for the 21st century so people can live well in them again. It needs an understanding, as I said, of what's important. We're still ruining our towns. We haven't stopped. Um, I'm just going to give you a, a quick look at a salutary tale of Mount Rath uh, in County Leash. Here is another uh, Morgan uh, photograph of Mount, Le uh, Mount Rath in the 1950s, where you can see very clearly, you can see this very nice triangular diamond space in the middle and a gorgeous market house up on, on arcades. Now that had become very derelict by the 1960s and there was an RTE program called Broadsheet, which used to run and, and uh, be uh, output every week. The market house had become derelict and Lila Doolan did a lot of canvassing of local opinion to see what should they do? And I don't have time to run the whole of the uh, video now, it, but it is on YouTube and it's really brilliant to watch, but it's, it's her interviewing of all of the people to find out what they thought. And to some people, it was a dangerous eyesore, to others, it was a great historic building, to others, it could have been a dance hall or a shrine even. So the building got pulled down in the end, that lovely building on the top left, and the buses were able to circulate, which was seen as the major problem, but the town lost its centerpiece. But just to end on a positive note, in March 2021, during the pandemic, the Irish Times asked four architects, including ourselves, to just speculate about outside spaces. So we chose Mount Rath, and we did a, a, a version of the Morgan County Campbell picture, uh, which, which just literally uh, tried to put it back the way we felt you could, you could reuse it. So Neil McCullough worked with Emma Cooney in our office to make this image to show how things could be. The town as an urban and social theatre, partly new, partly reused, and using up all those disused frameworks that already existed. So the old buildings become valued resources. All the upper floors around the square are occupied. The space is repaved in a simple and interesting way. And the market house is rebuilt exactly on its original footprint as a contemporary cultural building of a new type. So say a public hall over an open market and party space. And then there's also development in the backlands, people building new houses and gardens behind all those front facades and adding den density and interest to the experience of the town. So that's just that was just our suggestion as to what could happen all over the place. And I think that's really what I wanted to say today is that we have this amazing set of structures. We really need to intervene into them in a very positive way, but that does involve knowing where they came from and why they are like they are. So um, thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Valerie. Um, I'm going to say I think that your ending there gives meaning to all the voluntary work and time that this group, working group of the Centre for Irish Towns um, has put in. So it's fantastic to see a positive pilot. And I'm totally with you on that, that if only we had a few more real exemplars um, which gets over some of the barriers that Irish people would be very fast to embrace that. But anytime in all the years I've been looking at towns through schools of architecture, local authorities, I always think, are, are beholden to divide the money somehow equally between their children and all of them have about 20 towns and they can't be seen to give one above another. So, you know, I see in that a real trouble. So, um, I'm going to just ask you one more question and then we will have some more questions. Um, and it's, I counted in your book something like 124 drawings where you obviously traced the, the edges of all of these fantastic containers. And then you came up with this lovely lexicon, I'm going to say, of X and Y and radials and the cigar and the dumbbell type, etc. So I'm just wondering if you could just tell us a little bit more about how and you know, the kind of tell us about that journey. And you obviously then travel to these places to cross check, not just the historical maps, the drawing of them, but somehow 
the lie of the land. Mm. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. And and it involved both of those things. Like um, when I started this, which was a very long time ago, um, as part of that work you mentioned um, as as the uh, an emlet in, in Trinity, it was about, I mean, there was no digital anything. So um, I used to have to go to the National Library and order up the maps. So mm. I would, first of all, just go through each county and, and find the ones based on knowledge that uh, Neil and myself had kind of developed as we worked on a lost tradition, uh, which involved a huge amount of traveling around the country as well. So um, it was first of all, kind of starting with what I knew and looking at the form of those and then ordering up the photocopies because you had to order the photocopies and then they had to come like days later and then taking the best ones and saying, okay, these all make a kind of a sense together. And um, that's why I think it's important. People, people tend not to really look at the relevant bits of history if you look at any wikipedia entry for a town it'll start with the saints and scholars and then it very quickly goes to the gaa so there's not an awful lot in between sometimes so you have to do quite a lot of digging to recover what those histories were some of that involves working in local archives or or visiting or even talking to people and some of it is 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 through historic mapping um, and all the various um, literary sources that are already there and one of the great sources of course was the royal irish academy's town atlas series which are an absolutely wonderful set of documents, which are all done to a very, very uh, rigorous European standard. And those I find are really terrific. And the one thing that they don't focus enough on from an architectural point of view is the whole sense of public space. And you and I have had that conversation many times, Miriam, we're just that that's to us the kind of significant and wonderful thing about these places. Um, and I, I, I think that's when, when I started to try and categorize them, it just becomes very clear, like some of them are very simple linear things. And a lot of it depends on the economies that were there, what was funding them, what towns survived, what didn't, because there's equal numbers of ones that didn't survive at all that are things like Stratford on Slaney that started out really, really ambitious, but ended up even though the manufactory was still going in about 1908, I think, um, the, it just ended up kind of dying, maybe because it wasn't on the way to anywhere. It wasn't in a, it wasn't in the best position. So that's why you get to understand the concern of geographers about, you know, it's on this kind of river crossing and it's in the gap between these hills or whatever. So you do appreciate a kind of a lovely sense of the geography of things. And that's why I've said in, in the introduction that really the, the form of towns depends on the geography first, then the history, and, and all those things kind of come layering on top of each other, the economy, that, that was there, whether it was a medieval town, whether it was a monastic town. And I didn't go into every different type because there just isn't enough time, but it's enough to get people, I think, going to either direct them towards things things that everybody has written about um, and stuff that's there in front of your eyes if you just go looking. Um, but I have had to go back and I've looked at uh, so many towns in the last few months and years. And even, even recently, I, I, that's why I put in that commentary about just what people are doing now, because they're kind of just decorating things and putting in bollards and paving and, and uh, parking spaces, which don't really analyze what makes the space particular. And I think that's where architects have to come in. Mm. And as you say, I think if we could get local authorities to say, look, we're going to do this in three 15 in, in a 15 year bunch of three uh, types of five years or five bunches mm. of three years of funding. And we're going to take this town in the county this three years and that town the next three years and at least build up something. I do agree with you. It's it's a it's it's that need for equivalence, which which is bedeviling everybody. I call it sometimes the Garth Brooks problem. It can't <laughs> be the mall as it were. So I better I'll deal with some questions here from you. Paul Leach has raised a question here for you. Valerie, Hi, Paul. Um, in your book, can you please discuss further the morphology of the entry to our urban spaces at the centre of street plan, I guess, um, rather than the corners in our windswept, oceanic, rainy climate, the corners become inhabitable um, places rather than roots. I think that's something that you definitely wrote quite mm, a bit about mm. um, how we I often do yeah. step in yeah. and out and hold the corners. So holding the corners actually is is uh, is nearly my favorite device. It's why I love pictures like that one of of Port Arlington or even places like Derry and um, things like that that have that lovely closed corner. And Paul, I think you're absolutely right. The whole climate modification of how buildings have been used to create a space which then modifies the climate inside and makes a kind of a tiny microcosm. That to me is really critical. The medieval towns probably do that best because there's so much of them still left and they 
they've had so many years to kind of build up their strengths and their forms. The one of Clonmel that I, I showed at the very beginning with that closed end of that lovely, lovely street, which has the gate, although the gate is a 19th century reinvention of the, of the gate that used to be there, which gives you that sense of entry into a particular space. But you're so right about that point of entry, because um, if you take a town like Feathered, for example, um, and this is I suppose, again, one of my hobby horses that there isn't a protection for the space itself. In Feathered, not so long ago, they took down a fantastic 18th century barrack building, which wasn't very promising looking because people had forgotten what it was. And so um, it had had windows changed out and all that kind of stuff, and it looked pretty bad. But they took that out, which was the major blocking piece at the end of the town, and it immediately lost that sense of containment. And the same thing happened then in Port Arlington when they were doing that thing of making that inner relief road bang, the edge of the space goes, and suddenly you've lost all that sense of containment. So I think what you're talking about is, a, is a, a, an extraordinarily important point, that sense of containment and enclosure that we're trying to make, uh, because that's really what our towns are about. And isn't that something, it's, I always mm. think it's extraordinary because you've drawn all the plans, but yet that's something that you can only appreciate spatially yes. in section, yes. I think, or in 3D. Mm. So mm. thanks for drawing attention to that. Um, Alison Harvey, who you may know, um, a, a single um, advocate for the heritage of our towns and their vacancy, measuring and get, gathering the data. So Alison wonders, what's your take on the RT Great House revival? because it covers Strad Valley and County Leash. And she makes the uh, very pertinent note that almost half of all local authorities do not have a conservation officer. Um, so your thoughts on Strad Valley. Did you get mm. to see that episode? I didn't see that episode, but I can kind of imagine what might have been in it, in that I think Stradbally and the, the house, which is a fabulously uh, interesting set of palimpsests there, and, and it's something where if you do look at, at, at uh, my book, Alison, that's a, that's a, a lovely reference, actually, the, the series of maps that just go to show how it changed from being a 17th century house uh, in the plantations, from taking on the whole issue of the monastic piece of abbey that was there, changing the watercourses then making them uh, from something useful into something very, uh, very beautiful and romantic, how the house itself has relocated itself. But I suppose the aspect of the festival that's there has really made the town such a fantastic place. If you go there for the Boris Festival, for example, um, we are, am I talking about, yes, we are talking about the same, I'm sorry, I'm getting confused about my Stradbally's because there's another lovely yeah, one. Yeah, there in is Waterford. a few. Yeah. Um, but, but the one there with, 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 um, with Boris House in it, has that lovely sense of containment on a street. It has all of the layering of the older version, which, which really went across the plan of the town, but significant, the whole economic aspect of having a festival there, which again kind of coalesces everything into a, a period of total joy for a, a weekend um, where everybody literally descends on the place and it becomes a really lively place. I don't know, of course you can't do that everywhere, but I do think it's a very significant aspect of how we might think about how to regenerate towns because there will be at least one, I'd say, in every county where you could imagine that something like that could happen. And um, I think it's going to be something that's going to be very complementary to the whole thing about how do we get our towns back? How do we make something out of them? And again, it's like theatres or, um, you know, music festivals and things like that. They're, they're happening for, for one day. And, um, you know, I think when you think about things like I, I realize now, of course, I've mixed up Boris Festival with the uh, electric picnic, haven't I? And I'm sorry, this is, um, this is just <laughs> showing my Don't own, worry, I um, don't know about these places anymore. There. But, but no, yeah. I, I mean, I think, I think if you can manage to find a festival, and, and Lord Henry Mount Charles used to, started this whole thing in Slain uh, by getting that whole thing going, which I think is, is a really honourable way of trying to keep a big house going and also trying to find other ways to develop income streams. You um, know what's a great festival that mm. brings towns like is the Flat Kill. Maybe oh, since yeah. I have participated, you do get to see a lot of towns and they really transform. Um, just while we're coming up to the hour, Valerie, I wonder if I could invite you to have a question for Eleanor, um, who obviously is really interested, has sh found a gap in research, which is the boat photography and that lineage. Um, just any thoughts that you might have for Eleanor? 
Yeah, well, I, I must say it was lovely to see your photographs, Eleanor, because, um, and I, I think you're, you're absolutely right, you've identified something that is a, a, a huge gap. Um, I think there's probably intervening ones between, say, Robert French and uh, Martin Parr. Um, there, you know, there, there are lots of other people who've taken photographs, people like um, Paddy Healy, for example, have taken wonderful, wonderful photographs of Dublin. But I think um, I, it's like the question I used to ask myself over maps. I think you have to ask, why is this photograph being taken? And you said very much at the beginning, you were mentioning the whole idea of uh, the Lawrence uh, group commissioning Robert French to take these pictures because they were commercially useful and they also became then for us a hugely important record. Um, so I suppose another element that I think would be very interesting to add to it is the aspect of art and the idea that you're looking at in the in the most recent sets of photographs and I'm sure Hugh Campbell would have this aspect in his head when he's thinking about it and you know his recent book I'm sure you you know it backwards um space framed I think it's called um a lovely book about how photographs have influenced our ideas about spaces but I think if you if you were to actually describe those photographs as art pieces and what was what was interesting about them and Martin Parr is a, is a classic one for taking things that are the kind of the fabulous incongruities between the woman and the cow, for example, and the high ace van. There's a lovely um, set of completely uh, independent stories there that have just collided on a street at the, at the one minute. And um, he's got that fantastic ability to look at Ireland and, and in a way it's kind of even changed so much now since he would have taken those that you won't you probably won't have that same sense anymore of, of older Ireland colliding with the Ireland of, of, of uh, better coffee and, and things like that. But I do think there is a fantastic aspect to the way that you've talked about photographs, which maybe would be just interesting to explore, which is the kind of the art of the photograph itself, just like to, to develop that sense of incongruity which um, is, is a nice one, I think. Um, and people like Cartier-Bresson, of course, are, are terribly political in how they represent photographs. But as well as being political, I think you can, you know, there's ironic aspects, there's very humorous aspects, there's completely lost aspects. And in fact, when we were taking photographs for a lost tradition, we did a lot of that as well, where you'd find a car uh, reversed into the bottom of an 18th century dilapidated house where everybody had given up living on the upper floors because they were all leaking and they'd come down to the basement when they still needed the car to get in there. So they'd knocked a big hole in the wall and reversed the car in. And so they were literally living beside the car, which is a bit like Kevin Danaher's photographs of vernacular uh, country buildings where he's got cows living beside people at night and just the form of those buildings uh, really supporting mm -hmm. that. So, I mean, I, I love what you're doing. I think it's a really, really interesting uh, way to, to, to look at, at particular towns through that lens. So the best of luck with that. And I know you're nearly finished your thesis. So all so luck much. That's and really hope the internet keeps going. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Katrina is popping up, which kind of means well, just just to draw, remind everyone yeah. of time. I think we're almost at an end, um, so I think if we can. Wrap yeah, up. we didn't have any other burning. Well, we leave it for a second. Any other questions? Please put in the chat. Otherwise, that's been. Um, I'm looking forward to listening again to both your presentations. Really, not just that you've looked and brought your research, but you're really advocating too for new life in these places. Um, so thank you very much. Really. Thank you very much, everybody. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, thank you. for listening. It's really good. And thanks, thanks Katrina. a lot. Yeah. Thanks, thank Katrina, you all for organizing. Okay. <laughs> thanks, Mary. Okay. Thank you. Oh, I should say that there will be another episode one month from now, oh, yeah. just as people are leaving. And it's going to be on the topic of transformations of life and work in towns on Thursday, yeah. the 5th of May. So okay. it's always the first Thursday of the month in a kind of Irish town tradition. Dr. Orla Byrne, Ivo Con Carnell, and Stephen Wall will present then. So mm -hmm. come back again in a month. Details on the website. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Thanks a million, everybody. Thank Thanks. you. Bye-bye Thank now. you so much.